Hello and welcome to another one of Mr. Deeper's Science Lessons. For today's session you're going to need a book and a pen and in your books I'd like to get down today's title which is Natural Selection. For your starter activity I'd like to answer this question. How is the polar bear adapted to living in the Arctic? I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time pause the video and when you're finished we'll go through the answers together. So let's have a look at how this polar bear is adapted to life in the Arctic. It has thick fur for insulation. This allows the polar bear to keep warm. It also has black skin to absorb the heat. It also has large paws so it can get more traction in the snow and so it can break the ice so it can get food underneath. It also has greasy fur and this greasy fur helps it to repel the water when it has to swim. In today's lesson, we are going to be explaining the process of natural selection. We're also going to explain how natural selection can lead to the development of new species. And we're going to describe some of the proof for the theory of evolution. So first, let's have a look at the process of natural selection. Within a species, there is lots of variation. So there's lots of differences between each of the individuals. If there is a change in the environment, like let's say this water level rises, then only the animals with the best characteristics for the environment are likely to survive. And because they're more likely to survive, they are more likely to reproduce. Which means those better characteristics, those better genes, are passed on from one generation to the next generation. And all of the offspring will have the same characteristics. In this case, birds with longer legs. So now we're going to have a look at something similar. We've got two types of hoverfly. We've got A and we've got B. And these two hoverfly have a predator. And this predator eats all of the hoverflies. So it eats both A and B. But this predator does not eat wasps. So I want you to explain in terms of natural selection which species of hoverfly is more likely to survive. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. If you made your decision, let's have a look at our hoverfly. Now we need to answer this in terms of natural selection. And the first thing we need to say when we're answering a natural selection question is that there is a lot of variation within the same species. Hoverfly B looks more like a wasp. This is something we refer to as mimicry. And because our hoverfly predator doesn't eat wasps, that means hoverfly B is less likely to be eaten. And so hoverfly B is more likely to survive. But because we are answering this in terms of natural selection, we need to carry on past survival. Hoverfly B is more likely to reproduce. Hoverfly B will then pass on their genes and characteristics to their offspring. So more hoverfly offspring will end up looking more like wasps. So now we can explain the process of natural selection. Next, we're going to look at how this natural selection can lead to the development of new species. Here we have another population of birds, and there's lots of variation within this species of birds. Some have small beaks, some have big beaks, some have small legs, and some have larger legs. This population of birds live in Asia, and these birds migrate. And half of them migrate to Africa, and half of them migrate to Europe. And the conditions in both of these continents are very different. In Europe, the water is very deep. And so the animals with the best characteristics, the long legs, are more likely to survive. Because they're more likely to survive, they're more likely to reproduce. And that means that this long leg characteristic is going to be passed on to the next generation. And then all of the offspring are going to have longer legs. Whereas Africa has a different set of problems. The food is very deep below ground. This means that animals with the best characteristics, the long beaks, to be able to get the food, are more likely to survive. These birds with long beaks are then more likely to reproduce. And this long beak characteristic, this long beak gene, is going to be passed on to the offspring until eventually all of the birds will have long beaks. And then over a long period of time, the birds in Europe will all have very long legs and the birds in Africa will all have very long beaks. And if this happens over many generations, then eventually these two populations will become so genetically different that they will be considered a different species. So evolution is just one population which has been separated by some means 
and then two sets of natural selection occurs. But when you are answering an evolution question, it's going to be exactly the same as the natural selection question. You just need to say at the beginning of your answer that the populations get separated, and at the end of the answer, you need to say over many generations, they will become so genetically different, they will be considered a different species. So now, I would like you to describe how these squirrels could have come from a common ancestor species. So your answer should start with the common ancestor species, then they should become separated somehow, and then you need to explain the process of natural selection. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you got your answers? Let's have a look, starting with this common ancestor. You need to say that there is a lot of variation within the original ancestor species. You then need to say that two populations of the ancestor species became geographically separated, so they ended up in different parts of the world. You then need to say that squirrels with the best characteristics suited to their environment were more likely to survive and more likely to reproduce. Then, over many generations, the two populations will become so genetically different they will be considered different species. So now we can explain the theory of evolution in terms of natural selection. Next, we're going to have a look at some of the evidence for the theory of evolution. Our biggest chunk of evidence are fossils. And fossils can take on many forms, including impressions in softer sedimentary rocks and actual physical remains, and this is quite often teeth and bones. And next, we're going to do a task which allows us to assess which fossil is likely to be the oldest. Here we have the wall of the Grand Canyon, and two fossils have been extracted from it. Fossil A was taken from here, and fossil B was taken from down here. I want you to suggest which fossil is older, and I would like you to explain your answer. And if you really want to challenge, fossils A and B were structurally very similar. I want you to suggest why there wasn't much difference between the two species. So why was there not much evolution over such a long period of time? I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. So which fossil do you think is the oldest? Fossil B is more likely to be our older fossil, because it is buried under so much more earth. And it must have took tens of thousands of years for all this earth to be deposited on top of fossil B. Fossil A, because it's much nearer to the surface, implies that it died much more recently. Now the remains of A and B were very similar. Why was there not much evolution in the tens of thousands of years it took for this rock face to form? Because the conditions in this place likely stayed the same. It's likely that the water availability stayed the same. It's likely that the temperature stayed the same. And so whatever the adaptations fossil B had were already best suited for the environment. And this was passed on through the generations all the way until we got to the animals which made up fossil A. If there is very little change in the environment over a long period of time, then evolution happens a lot slower. So now we can describe some of the proof for the theory of evolution. And we're going to look at this in a bit more detail in later lessons. Which means there is one more thing I would like us to do before we wrap this lesson up, and that is our plenary. And I would like you to explain, in terms of natural selection, which of these two species of moth is more likely to be successful. Both of these are peppered moths. We've got our grey looking moth over here, we've got our black moth over there. Remember to start by talking about the variation. Which one's more likely to survive? Which one's more likely to reproduce? Which one's more likely to pass on their genes to their offspring? And what gene, what characteristic is it which has made that moth successful? If you've got any really good answers, I'd like to stick it down in the comments below. But for now, I hope you've had a great lesson, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the lesson. If you found it useful, don't forget to press the like button. And why don't you subscribe and press the bell icon as well so you know when the next lesson's available. You can also support me on Patreon and you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter and I appreciate all the support. And I'll see you next time.